Okay, hello, welcome to Soccer 3220. This week's lecture is on um, a research project uh, done by myself, uh, Julia Coffey, David Ferugia and Lisa Atkins, where we've been looking at um, the work that young people do in bars and service work. So this week, um, rather than just hearing my voice crapping on for the whole hour, we get to talk to Julia as well. So Julia, thanks for joining us. Hello. <laughs> um, so yeah, as, as usual, um, you'll see that the lecture notes are quite detailed and I'd expect hopefully that you've read the um, lecture notes beforehand and what we're going to do now is just talk to them so we won't go into everything in nitty gritty detail, we're just going to kind of draw attention to the things that we think are most interesting um, and to guide you through those. So um, basically this research project um, stems out of numerous reasons really. Firstly, in youth studies as we've looked at throughout the course, um, the transition from school to work is one of the key traditional areas of youth studies. Um, but as you know, the work of Beck and others have shown that that's become more precarious and elongated. And so youth studies has developed a, you know, a really sturdy body of work to understand how that works and the inequalities involved, etc. As we've, we've kind of been looking at this research though, that um, while there's a lot of stuff about exploitation, precarity, um, prolonging of that transition, there's not as much study about the actual practices of labour, what young people do at work, what's, I suppose, special about what they bring to economies, and why are they so important to economies. So this work looks at the, the very notion of labour, and you might remember from first year, Marx talks about labour as being the thing that the working class has, the only thing they have to be able to survive in a capitalist society. They sell their labour to the ruling class. Essentially, that's through uh, producers' notions of exploitation and alienation. Again, there's lots of good stuff in youth studies that covers that. What we want to look at here is the way that economies have changed and certainly still drive notions of exploitation, and particularly young people are very exploited. But we're also interested in how economies and particularly nighttime economies, um, I suppose need young people in their presence to create a particular vibe, to, to make them cool, funky places, to make them sexy, and all that kind of thing. And this becomes the kind of notion of labour that we we're interested in at, in this. Yeah, so I guess this approach we're taking in the study to uh, sociologically is really trying to marry the um, macro and micro practices that are going on so that what people actually do with the broad social structures that have shaped the changes to the economy and the different kinds of work people do nowadays so we're trying to explore really those large-scale transformations and shifts that have happened in context of young people's actual working lives yeah that's right so that's the contribution of the study basically, but that's also, I think, what's going to make it interesting for you guys to hear about. Yeah, so it might, I'd say, actually, a lot of people listening to this may actually be working in these situations exactly. or situations like that. So, um, in, in another part of the course, I was talking about the DIY culture stuff um, and the different kind of careers, you know, that those creative people were trying to do there um, in a way of maintaining creativity and this kind of stuff. In a way, they're a kind of special test case um, that also highlighted you know different things that have kind of changed and the relations between the ways individuals go through this transition i suppose what we're looking at in this is much more run-of-the-mill normal kind of thing that young people do um, as I, again i said earlier in the course is that um, it's become completely normal now for young people to be paid less than um, a general population you know it's almost like uh, you know legalized discrimination in a way it's like young people are meant to have these jobs with training wheels before they get the real job. Um, so again, this is kind of an example of that, but what we want to show here too is the way that the very notion of youth is produced at work, um, and also the ways, I suppose, that um, the, the various figures of youth, the, you know, the symbols of youth are kind of used in that economy, and they become something that kind of uh, are used to sell us stuff, to provide us with a kind of exciting experience or whatever as well. What we'll also look at too is the way that kind of um, it means that some people end up being stuck mm. in those kind of not real jobs and there's some data in here that um, we have that kind of speaks to that. Yeah, so sim symbols of youth and what it is to be a young person is leveraged to become something that is um, a product of value and we're looking at how that occurs basically. Yeah, yeah. 
and how it's created. Yeah. It's youth is itself created during the process. That's right. So where Marx had an idea of that, um, you know, our labour would be basically we get up in the morning, we go to work, we clock on in the factory, we do stuff with our hands and bodies to make things, then we leave work, go home and kind of have our leisure time. An interesting thing that what we're finding in this research is that these new kinds of labour start to blur the lines between production and consumption, between you know work and home, between pleasure and leisure and, and labour. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we want to highlight here is it's the very presence, the very subjectivity of young people themselves that is being extracted here for a form of labour, uh, for a form of value in terms of the labour being, being done. Mm -hmm. Young people's presence in these spaces is one of the things that produce these bodily sensations, the a cool vibe, a party atmosphere, you know, um, and that kind of thing. So here we're, we kind of want to point out that um, the productions of these sensations and emotions, these experiences, are the actual product of the work as much as, you know, pouring a schooner or, you know, um, making a espresso martini. Yeah. 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 So. Um, the work also aligns with kind of development of new theories of, of labour. Um, so, you know, we've talked a little about Marx in the 70s and 80s. Um, Ali Horschild uh, developed the idea of emotional labour that pointed out that, you know, um, labour was particularly gendered, that women in particular were kind of called upon to do more caring and, and things like that. Um, then in the kind of 80s and 90s, there's a particular stream of Italian Marxists to start writing about these new forms of labour the effective, the immaterial, and the free. So, um, Lazzarato in particular starts talking about this idea of immaterial labour. He just divides it into two different kind of contents, I suppose, the informational, and here you can think about all the stuff that goes on the internet, you know, all the kind of stuff we might think about in terms of prosumption today. And there's the cultural, uh, where he talks about how immaterial labour involves a series of activities, not necessarily recognised as work, that actually produce the very things that the economy needs to be, I suppose, um, to, to, to extract value and profit. It produces things like fashions, tastes, consumer norms. These things become part of what's extracted from the, the worker and, and kind of, you know, squeezed value out of. So, yeah, so it produces something that then you can go and buy. So it creates yeah. an idea of something that then the product will be born of that that then people can spend money on and yeah. possess. Yeah, that's right. So, in this sense, you know, a form of immaterial labour is not just the kind of, you know, you know, I spoke about hipsters in the course, you know, the cool looking barista with the beard and the tats at the coffee stand, you know, that's, it's not, that, that thing there, that kind of interaction is not just you buying a coffee, there's a whole lot of other stuff going on there about taste and, 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 you know, you interactions be between yourself. men and women and, yeah. you know, who you want to be around and all this kind of stuff. That in and of itself becomes part of the product that um, things like effective labour and immaterial labour consider. And so you can see as well, you can probably start to see then how class and gender um, and other ethnic markers are yep. brought into that process to be something that you are aligning yourself with and you're choosing to spend money in particular ways based on those sensibilities. That's too. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yep. definitely things like, you know, constant here that part of the uh, immaterial and effective labour are kind of constantly bringing up sex and tastes and all these kind of things that mm. are present in all human relations and in a way they kind of um, extract that out of the individual labourers and they monetize them. Yeah. So there's the immaterial labour is kind of a broad term for all these forms of labour I suppose and, and, and it's not really important to get bogged down too much about kind of saying this is immaterial labour and that's effective labour or whatever. Um, you know, there's some semantic differences between that. Um, Hart and Negri's kind of huge works throughout the 90s and 2000s about empire and the multitude and all that kind of stuff also are very influential here. Um, they talk about how um, effective labour is embodied and aestheticised labour, which involves the creation and manipulations of symbols, meanings, identities, emotions and relationships. So here the product of the labour isn't, again, just pr the production of things. It's not, you know, like the factory pumping out stuff, it's the um, production of transpersonal effects about relations to others, producing feelings, um, producing vibe, I suppose, is the um, term that our bar workers use all the time. Yeah. So that's, um, as we're going to go on to talk about in our work with producing vibe as being the pro the thing that effective labour produces, so that's the, the thing that you get that is effective. 
I guess Hart and Negri's broader point is that um, that they make through effective labour is that basically everything that we can think of is can be brought into the process mm. of creating labour and being sold. So all of those things that they're saying embodied aestheticizes symbols, meanings, identities, emotions. So it's basically the capacity to co-opt your most unspoken, um, subconscious, inner preferences or um, sensibilities, all of that is brought into the process of labour creation. That's right, yeah. And so importantly here, it speaks to that kind of blurring of the lines between, you know, yeah. what were traditionally different parts of our lives. What um, these new forms of labours, I think, tend to display is that um, as workers now, we, we increasingly don't switch off. Yeah. Um, so this idea of effective labour, again, speaks to the very, our very subjectivity becomes part of who, uh, part of it, part of the work and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you, you'll hear again in, the, in some of the data coming up that, you know, uh, work at the, the bar workers that are working in places that they particularly like, mm -hmm. like the, the places they would attend in their leisure time, they talk about it as if it's their lounge room. Mm -hmm. um, and there's kind of ways of, they're not really separating this kind of work, um, non-work period anymore. I've included the just a quick thing there about free labour. It's not something we're going to talk about, but Terra Nova in particular um, talks about this in terms of the internet. Um, here, you know, how the internet is built on so much free labour of basically all the individual consumers, whether it's, you know, liking something on Facebook, writing a uh, review of something on TripAdvisor or Amazon. All this is free labour in the sense mm. that it's the consumers themselves producing the content that is kind yeah. of manipulated and sold back as product by yeah. these large platforms. I mean, Google's always trying to get you to upload photos of wherever it's found out you are yeah. based on your phone. That's yeah, 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 yeah. It's tracking you and all that kind of stuff when you're walking around cities and... Um, all in the name of providing better data, but also in the name of you know selling better data to advertisers. Yeah. So I'm not going to go into that in too much detail here. I just wanted to put that in there because I thought it might be useful for some of the um, essay questions. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we've just briefly touched upon the broad um, theories, and here we kind of want to think about how effect is central to this kind of service work. And again, service work is something that um, many young people um, are involved in in that transitional period. Yeah, and crucially, this kind of work is, um, of, you know, one of the most casualised industries. So it has all those hallmarks of precarity, of um, un, uh, unstable hours, of yeah. um, all of those things that can be useful for young people in trying to navigate all the other commitments in their lives that ultimately, um, yeah, is, is a pretty unstable form of work to be involved right, in, yeah. or in terms of what kind of power so again, you uh, do or don't have. The, that kind of exploitation stuff that you know yeah. traditional labour market studies looks at, this is certainly p present throughout these, this, this data. Pretty much all the um, participants weren't getting award wages. Um, mm -hmm. it, award wages were seen as kind of a, like almost a reward, or you, you, if you work and you do good at the job for a year or two, you might start getting award wages. They had very little control over when they could work. Mm -hmm. um, there was very little chance of kind of moving up some kind of ladder and all that kind of stuff. So again, these jobs are your atypical, precarious labour, short term, um, zero contract kind of hours contract kind of stuff. Yeah, and very low union membership too in these yeah. industries. Some some of the absolute lowest in anywhere in the yeah. in any industry in the world basically. We were actually told repeatedly by uh, people that you know um, if they joined a union they probably wouldn't have got hired. Yeah. So. Um, you know, so there's all that stuff going on. So it's certainly we're not trying to downplay any of that. It's really important. Um, I suppose what we want to talk about here too that's absent from labour is the way that kind of work is pleasurable. Mm. So a lot of the participants here talk about all the pleasures they had at work, mm. um, how there was a lot of fun involved, and again we'll get into interest, get into that more in, in, throughout the lecture. Um, but there's this kind of, again, this constant blurring here of lines between fun and harassment and like, um, you know, Fun and that and kind of thing, fun so. and exploitation, fun, you know, fun and alienation. There's almost a some, some of them towards the end, after they've been doing 10 years, talk about how actually they're sick of having fun. Yeah. Um, and this is often a point where they try and want to get out, and sometimes it's really difficult to get out if you've been doing it for ages. Yeah. And I think <laughs> maybe it's the, the thing of because it's fun and because they are enjoying aspects of the work 
um, and they know that's what they're being expected to do, they know that others are recognising they're having fun. Maybe that's one of the things that stops them from feeling like they can complain about wages yeah. or complain about things because they kind of might feel on this some level guilty for enjoying their work too much to be able to ask them for the rights that they are supposed to totally. enjoy. Totally. So much so that, you know, some of them actually talk about it. it's not a real job, even though they're working 12 hours, they're picking up, you know, 18 gallon kegs yeah. Yeah. Um, and having to kick out drunk blokes and all this kind of stuff. So there's this, yeah, as we're getting to more and more, you'll see this is kind of interesting juxtaposition between the affordances and risks of the work mm. um, that I think uh, quite, I suppose, representative of many of the working situations of young people um, yeah. in that early part of the transition. Um, in terms of the notion of effect, um, again, we're not going to go into that too much detail here. I've spoken a little bit about it um, throughout the course, but certainly um, check out Julia's uh, work on that if you want to go into that in any more depth. She's got lots of papers and a book about that kind of about that stuff, particularly around body and uh, masculinity and femininity. Yeah. Um, but do you just want to say a little bit about the notion of effect? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so it's basically just trying to, um, like I was saying before, match those macro and micro processes that go on to try to create some picture of what we call society and people's interactions with it. So it's trying to get at those um, those bodily feelings and sensations we have that really. Um, are a huge part in our own inner workings, but they also match up with, um, they're not purely individual feelings. These are inherently social mm. ways of embodying the social, really. Um, and the argument that sociologists and that I make about the importance of affect is that it helps us to try to not just marginalise the body and those kinds of sensations um, in favour of you know rationality or, or cognitive um, types of processes as being the only ones that really matter. Mm. So it's trying to sort of bring in these aspects as being important to try and understand the dynamics of people's identities and their ways of relating to the world and the practices that they do. So um, the process of effective labour that um, Hart and Negri talk about use that same, I, I you know paraphrase yeah, 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 <laughs> that a lot, yeah. but they take that same kind of Deleuzean inspired. Um, view of affect too. So that's something you can go right into if you're interested, but that's, I guess, top yeah. line what it's aiming to do. And, then, and one of the things I think that's really interesting about it is it shows that our emotions aren't individual, that they're social. Yeah. Um, and so I suppose, again, to relate it to the data we're showing here, like, you know, I'm sure you guys listening to this have been to pubs and parties where there's this sort of like atmosphere going on and there's, just, it's, it's more, there's more going on just about your own mood or the way you feel. There's things there that affect the way you feel a particular song could come on, the whole vibe of the room will change, right? Mm. So this is kind of that effective atmosphere. You'll hear that the throughout the data they use the term vibe a lot. And as they talk about that, much of the work that they have to do is about trying to manipulate this vibe. Mm. And the vibe itself is the product that they're trying to, to sell and maintain. And, um, and as importantly, yeah. these things are kind of... I suppose there's, there's contours of the way these things work through those kind of traditional sociological notions, I suppose, of gender, sexuality and class. These things are very present in the in various atmos affective atmospheres. Mm. Um, I've been talking about Bourdieu throughout the course. You can imagine that, you know, if you're, I don't know, uh, to use examples from Newcastle, say, if you go to the Lassa Gary a lot, you're probably not going to feel that comfortable at King Street Hotel. Um, here there's particular taste cultures what and things that you like will make you feel more or less comfortable in a particular atmosphere mm. um, and vice versa. The same can be going with like various gender discourses. Yeah, it's like if you're a young woman and walk into a tab at, yeah. you know, 2pm in the afternoon or something yep. on any given day, you're probably going to feel some particular affective um, embodied sensations, shall we that's say, right. that yeah. around discomfort. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's a really good example, yeah. Yeah. So our research kind of, kind of, draws out some of these gender and class and not so much ethnic um, differences here because the cohort we spoke at in the kind of, you know, the inner north of um, Melbourne was particularly white. Mm. Um, but, you know, more broadly, these things would certainly um, be applicable in terms yeah, of thinking about Yeah, but certainly kind of dynamics things. to be explored yeah. in different yeah. contexts with that. The whiteness, the whiteness, the very whiteness of these places too would be its own form of kind of affective exclusion for people that don't kind of look at and fit yeah, in and that kind of thing. Exactly. So, um, 
as we go through these examples, yeah, I, I'm hoping you're thinking about the different ways that you know things like gender and sexuality and class I inflect what's going on here. One of the things we are talking about, one of the kind of in terms of the study itself, is that yeah, again, we're talking about those kind of inner north bars in Melbourne, around Fitzroy, around in Brunswick, you know. Brunswick Street and fit, fit, uh, Smith Street, places like that. Mm -hmm. They tended to be places with uh, live music going on and you know fairly kind of underground live music as much as possible. So, and we are generally here talking to young people who, um, where their tastes match those places. Most of them are working in these places because they were going there as punters, and quite often they end up getting a job there because of that. So there's a close so social proximity between you know who they are and the kind of taste cultures of what's mm. what what's what the venues that they're working in so the project here you know um, it, it, we've been doing we've, we've done interviews um, in Melbourne and Newcastle um, and you know we've the, the, the interviews essentially take as long as they take there was one that you know takes about 30 minutes we've done but we kind of had to stop after about two and a half I think we were talking forever uh, the, the, this particular um, research and section we're talking about here is just the Melbourne stuff. Um, the people are between 18 and early 30s, and I think as I've spoken out throughout the course, that's a good indication of that extended transition. Here. Youth is the, the, the markers of youth are moving beyond the um, age category. Uh, the, yeah, 25, and the markers of adulthood are, you know, moving way out again. So again, we this kind of speaks to that kind of data that I've been talking about about the extension and blurriness of transitions. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> so, yep, yeah, uh, so essentially, yeah, the, this was kind of the inner north of Melbourne, you know, and again, it's that, pl that place very stereotypically has been associated with hipsters that I've also been talking about in the course. An interesting aside here is that, you know, when you talk about this to the, those guys, they kind of know that and they laugh at it, they think it's ironic. Um, as I was talking about the other week, they don't talk, of, they, they certainly wouldn't call themselves hipsters. Mm -hmm they kind of know that they are there's that whole kind of ironic distance thing going on so I'm just trying to paint a picture here of the bars that we're talking about I suppose and who, who's there and who's not because it is a specific it is a specific kind of service work we're talking about we're not talking about it in general yeah. we're talking about these uh, very uh, specific locations in yep. terms of the, um, the class that's going on there yep. in terms of the taste in terms of the affective labor as a product it is a very particular Kind of thing that's right. Talking yeah. about here. That's right. So these aren't your kind of beer barn pubs. They're not um, nightclubs with you know electronic dance music going. Um, essentially, yeah, they're, they're kind of um, kind of pubby barry spaces, but mostly with like kind of artistic lefty politics. They're um, kind of hip aesthetic, underground music, whatever yeah. that is. Yeah. And we're kind of we'll be trying to define what that is through the participants' yeah. data as well. That's right. It's sometimes hard to put your finger on. Yeah. And that's the thing that makes it cool. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, cool is always evasive. So, mm. and importantly here, you know, these kind of hip, you know, areas are profoundly important now to economies in global cities. Like, Melbourne's particularly well known in Australia for having it, um, and you know, there's cities all around the world that kind of almost market themselves to this kind of um, taste cultures, um, and you know, there's there's different kind of. Uh, versions of that in, you know in different places but nighttime economies in particular are uh, really important in terms of the ways that you know capitalism works but certainly in terms of how cities want to attract tourists and even want to attract you know new workers and residents as a way of kind of making the town or the city an attractive place to live mm. so here coolness is you know something that's kind of sold and the, I suppose this is part of the effective labor that these young people are performing for the city in many ways mm. The bars themselves, you know, they, you know, they kind of tend to be fairly, in inverted commas here, lefty spaces in a way, right? They have often have unisex toilets, um, have you know safe space stickers and that kind of stuff going on. Um, so yeah, they are very um, kind of niche cultural spaces, I suppose. Or it kind of would consider themselves as being uh, progressive. Yeah, yeah, that's I guess right. Is one way of saying it. Too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to actually start talking about. Um, the data that we have, so that's what we're going to spend the rest of the time doing now. <coughs> so, um, very quickly um, in the research, we found that um, often the the participants were kind of almost dismissive of the particular skills, like you know bodily skills, I suppose. Uh, you know, in terms of being behind a bar. Here you see Greg tells us, you know, it's really easy. I mean, a chimp can pull a beer. So they. 
often kind of started quite modest about what the job entailed, but very quickly when we started getting into these interviews, they uncovered a whole realm of things that they were doing in the day-to-day labor of the job that you know, isn't just about providing drinks, it's about doing all this other stuff that in many ways they took for granted. Yeah. Um, in some ways, it took a while for them to realize that they were even doing this and it was kind of to get them to uncover to talk about. Others knew that they were doing it, particularly mm-hmm. people that were working for a long time. They kind of almost developed a performance of this over time. And I'd suggest particularly the women are yeah. aware that the, yeah. all of the different stuff other than the physical pouring of drinks, collecting glasses, that yeah. the labour it takes to um, interact with people is work. Definitely. And that's what Hox Child's initial findings were in like, the managed heart and her early work. That's, yeah. that's emotional labour. So what we're talking about here is different conceptually in effective labour, but we're still kind of trying to talk about that same process in the fact that there's a lot more that makes up a job other than just you doing the actual physical yeah. parts of it. And particularly this kind of work leverages all of the other kind of interpersonal relationship, um, managing your own behaviour and trying to make the experience nice for someone. Yep. That is that is the job. Yep. That is the product That's right. that creates effect yep. or a particular kind. Yep. So you can see here, you know, they start talking about vibe, you know, it's about creating vibe. It's like, you know, je ne sais quoi, the moment of enjoyment is really indescribable. So, um, what was interesting about this kind of, the notion of the vibe, and they, they all knew that kind of part of their role was kind of the performance and maintaining and producing this vibe, is that they would do it re- almost regardless of their moods. It was kind of, you know, you could come into work feeling good and you can just get into it. We had others kind of say that sometimes, and this speaks to the pleasure of work, that, you know, they may have had a crappy day at um, university or having an argument with their boyfriend, come to work, and all of a sudden they have to kind of do this performance, mm. and all of a sudden the kind of shittiness of their day goes away and they kind of starting to feel happy and they create this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm-hmm. So here the, the, the kind of almost social gravity of the bar produces this kind of performance that can, you know, even make people feel better about themselves if they're having a bad day. So yeah. there's a real kind of power of this effective atmosphere, of not just about producing it for the punters, but they often talked about how the staff themselves would kind of vibe together. Yeah. They would, um, you know, have fun with each other. And, then, and this whole thing about affect is, you can see with <coughs> what Steve was talking about then, it's not it's not just personal, it's not just about you, that it all it's all bigger than you all the time. So you have yeah. your own perspective you bring in there, but, like, it's not, it, that's not all that's being created, that yeah. you all get sort of caught up in the same atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. And it catches you up. You kind of, It's like kind of being caught up in a wave or something like that. Yeah, 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 that's right. And so the, the next quote here, Christine, is, I think this is a really good example of it in terms mm-hmm. of the skills, right? She kind of, she reckons she's crap at pouring drinks. That's not actually the case. But, you know, she talks about how she spent a few months of the job actually still charging people the old prices. So, like she hadn't even taken any notice of the prices gone up. But she knows that she's good, good at the job. She creates the vibe, you know, people come back and say, where's that girl tonight? Now, as far as, you know, not charging the right prices for jobs, the managers of these places, oh, for, for drinks, sorry, the manager of these places don't care about the fact that you're not charging that extra 20 cents. If you're doing the kind of vibe performance right, you're bringing in more punters, you're creating the space that people want to be in. Going there so, to see her. Yeah, people are deliberately coming in to kind of be around these people. So yeah. um, that's something that she knows that she knows that's the case of why she's there, and I think... There's quotes later on where the, some of the girls talk about they know they've been employed because they're good looking. Yeah, that's one of the um, And they kind of put a little bit in, and in particular some of the girls that um, have strong feminist principles find that problematic. Um, yeah, find that quite problematic and confronting, but um, they often then kind of do something with that in their own feminist practice as well. Yeah. So here again, we're talking about how, you know, the production here is not just pouring a schooner or mixing a gin and tonic, it's about you know, creating a particular feeling in this place that people can come and be a part in. of, draws people in. Yeah. Yeah, so this is what we were, what, um, we were speaking to before, where um, Catherine talks about um, it's nothing worse than um, when you're in a bad mood or it's kind of the atmosphere isn't happening. So whether you come to work in a bad mood or not, or if the atmosphere or vibe is just down, it's like that's nothing worse than being at work and it's like that. But so it's sort of in her interests and at her other um, co-workers' interests to try to have fun because it makes work better yeah, anyway. That's right. And that's, you know, convenient, of course, because that's what management want them to do. So it kind of all just self-fulfills yeah. in that way. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
Now, interesting here in terms of that performance and enjoyment and vibe and all that kind of stuff, again, you know, uh, the, the Borgia, Borgia stuff and subcultural capital in particular is kind of interesting here to think about, that kind of homology and proximity stuff. We had, we had some interviews with uh, one girl in particular who was working at a kind of really, um, well, a reasonably well thought of restaurant through the day and then working at the bar at night. She really didn't like working in the restaurant. She called the rest. She, she she gave us this great great quote was essentially that restaurants are yes places, bars are no places. At the restaurant, she had to kind of do that. You know, customers are always yes, right sorry, thing. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, I'm yeah. sorry about your, the, you know, the chicken, the foie gras isn't you know, whatever. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, so there's that. And then um, when she come to this place at night, it was a pub that she'd been going to for years. She really loved coming there. So her kind of performance to be able to kind of create that vibe was much more in their own words and I'm, but I'm going to put it in inverted commas natural um, because yeah. it's much more close to their own taste um, preferences it's much easier to perform and to create that vibe in those situations um, yeah. when you're forced to actually be further away from the things that you like and work in a situation where you probably wouldn't go there you don't like the people there you think that you know you're you're serving a $50 meal to some, some, some lawyer that you think's a wanker, right? Yeah. It's much more difficult then to be able to kind of um, be able to perform that. For someone like her, and this is That's the right. thing, this is, this is what effective labour takes in, is that you, it, it rewards work or tries to sort of capitalise on the sense that you have um, a natural way of being and that work will pay you to be just be yourself and That's to right. just mobilise all of your yeah. internal um, personality characteristics so yep. that it, it does resonate instead of having that feeling of dissonance, like this isn't my space, this isn't me. Yep. So um, that kind of works to everyone's benefit in this form of labour. So that's not to say it's not problematic. You can see that it can be, like we said before, more difficult to... Um, disagree with anything if you feel like your whole person is this job if this right. everything is you then if something's wrong with it then obviously yeah that is going to have some kind of impact on yourself and your identity potentially as well definitely it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Against. yeah yeah so and, the, and tim's quote here talks about that in a way you know for me it's when the bands i like are playing here you know i'm around people that i'm comfortable with you know it feels like a community now I re the use of the, the term community there for when you're at work serving people i think is really telling about how mm. how at home they feel in these areas so yeah. um, you know the labor is experience is more effortless and pleasurable you don't have to seem to kind of do the emotional labor to make it happen mm -hmm. because you can feel like you can be yourself more yeah so where you know I, I would say you know uh, talking to Tim that he was going to the, the bars in the south of Melbourne where it's all about wearing Prada and having a Porsche mm -hmm. you know he would feel much less comfortable there and would find be able to create the you know, vibe in a venue like that almost impossible so yeah that's the kind of I suppose subculture, class, gender, kind of, you know, location kind of uh, contours that we want to yeah. kind of accentuate how effective labour draws out your very being yeah. and tries to use that to create these kind of comfortable, happy, shiny places. Okay, so we've already kind of talked about this already, you know, about creating vibe. It kind of blurs the leisure between production and consumption, work and leisure, um, you know, workplace and home. Um, you know, and this is increasingly the case, I would say, across a lot of job categories. You know, for instance, I work at home three days a week now. I'm often, you know, watching TV at 11 o'clock at night, answering emails on my chest, on my phone, you know. Like, so, you know. You'll have that yeah, image now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, this, this, this kind of uh, theor theorising of labour kind of speaks to the kind of more broad blurring of lines between, you know, those things. Um, what um, and now remember the the people that are writing about this are kind of neo Marxists. They're very interested in how this means that there's kind of ever increasing new ways to, for capitalism to extract value out of its labourers um, by blurring these lines, by making feel people feel at home at work, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. It kind of may mean that there's kind of almost you know capitalist exploitation with less alienation. Mm -hmm. But as we'll kind of point out in a minute, I suppose with various conflicts and problems that particularly the young women have to deal with at work, that's not always the case, but it's kind of just, you know, increasingly, you know, part of that labour process. Yeah, and I guess that capitalism is working in ever more insidious ways, you know, so this isn't at all a celebration of, um, isn't it great everyone just gets to be themselves? Um, 
you know, isn't this great? Everyone gets to be themselves at work. Everyone's happy then. Happy workers, happy everyone. It's very much that this reaches the, you know, takes every part of your being to keep creating. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So this speaks to um, what we've already been talking about um, in terms of young people's um, kinds of employment patterns that they already yeah. Yeah. Up in. So early, early, I think uh, earlier in the course I talked about how, you know, I've been talking a lot about how this extension of the transition period and, you know, uh, also the very idea of adulthood, you know, so if you're a 40 year old now with, you know, you might be living with someone but you, you know, might be working casually, you mightn't have kids or you're not married, Does, are you not an adult because you haven't ticked off all those markets? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, the data we have here is kind of speaks to this kind of stuff. Um, so. There's, there's numerous, I suppose, you could say typologies of the ways that young people move through this work. Some of them just kind of get it while they're at uni, work at nights, go through the degree, get their degree, they're out of there. Others find themselves, um, particularly those that don't have a lot of parental support or monetary support, having to work quite a lot to support themselves um, if, even if, when they're studying. This somewhat creates a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy where it's difficult for them to do well at study because they're working so much. Um, we had a couple of uh, participants who were really good at bar work, so they were offered better and better work or better and better shifts, and so all of a sudden they might have a year off their um, degree, and then you know all of a sudden they're 26, they've got half a degree, and you know it's very difficult to kind of mm. get out of this work. Um, so what was interesting about this too is that. That's that, that that at that point when the kind of party's over, mm. when is when the exploitative conditions of the work seems to kind of rear its head. Yeah, all of a sudden. They're all of a sudden they're like, oh them. right, yeah, I can't. I like I'm not earning a lot of money. Oh, I have to. I don't have a lot of control over when I'm working. I need to get out and get a real job. So, yeah. Um, yeah so and and another thing that all all of well not all of them but many of them spoke about is basically how much you drink. Mm. So. Again, these are again particular kinds of bars and you know kind of hip bars, I suppose. But this does happen in most establishments. Is that the bar staff, while at work, are quite often on the piss themselves. Now they'll have a few part, drinks here and there. Part of creating the fun and the vibe is you Definitely. You're getting loose as well That's with, right. the, with yeah. the patrons. Yeah. So even though, in terms of our H and S or you know service of alcohol rooms, that's kind of frowned upon. It just happens, and it happens everywhere. It's also they also sp all spoke about the absurdity of. Um, the kind of alcohol liquor laws licensing. where the, the liquor licenses and like how you know you weren't meant to allow people to get drunk in a pub where people are there buying alcohol to get drunk and there's this, all this kind of weird unspoken kind of regulating but not regulating stuff going on so that's part of the atmosphere as well um, so but yeah we certainly had um, some participants in their late 20s who you know had been doing it for 10 years who you know largely they're not alcoholics but they're drinking a lot they're often have, you know, sore knees and backs from lifting and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, working at night does this other thing. We won't talk about this too much at this either, but there's this working bar work, working weekends and the likes of stuff, that, that kind of thing, actually um, uh, desynchronizes you with other people in your life. So because you're working at nights and weekends when people are actually doing their leisure stuff and you tend to be off work when everyone else is studying or working, what can often happen is you'll start to lose touch with your loved ones or your your, um, your peer group and your friends. And what then tends to happen is that the people in these industries start developing new groups with other people that are working in the bar industry, you know, and they go out on a Monday night and this kind of thing. So there's this desynchronization in terms of temporality. This can have effects on, you know, finding a partner and again, being able to study properly, being able to get a real job. And I. <laughs> Uh, and I'm saying real job there in inverted commas like it is written on the slide there because yeah, yeah. these things, you know, these bar work is real jobs. Just the kind of irony is that some of the bar workers don't refer to it as a... And maybe because it has that association with you. Yeah, yeah. That it's, it's, it's not, a you job. haven't made it yet. It's, yeah. a, it's a thing on the way to being an adult. So yeah. it doesn't have, then it's it's not really then valued. And you can see that in the ways that it's right. monetized or... Yeah, no, absolutely. That's really, yeah, that's right. So these two little examples here, you know, we had... Um, we had uh, this guy um, who 
he loved working in bars so much that he finished his undergrad degree then did a master's degree so he could keep working in bar then he did another master's degree so he could keep working in a bar and then he kind of went overseas and did it and then he came back and got a full-time job in the public service and he had a lot of support from his parents um and uh, uh yeah. and um yeah a lot of support from his parents he didn't really have to do that so he, he had also a lot of social capital where his parents helped him to get the job so really interesting here he even though he works now you know nine to five and probably more in the public service um, Monday to Friday he still liked bar work so much that he'll go and do what's called a rock star shift sometime on the weekend now the rock star shift is basically you just turn up pour drinks and leave or you, while you do there you're creating the vibe as well obviously but you don't have to do any preparation you don't have to do any cleanup People that, again, you're thinking about building up cultural capital here, who have worked in the industry for a long time, become well known as being good bartenders, and they can quite often go around to different places and do these shifts. The other thing that he was be able to do as well is he was be able to, if he was doing a rock star shift at a place on a Saturday night, it means that he can get all his mates into the venue if it's hard to get in. So there's all this kind of, you know, symbolic capital and, you know, status reward. going around and reward yeah, going around about that as well. Reward, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you can imagine here if you get a job as a kind of button down public servant that this is a kind of cool thing to do on the weekends if you can provide space for your friends to come in and, and go to these places. Yeah. But there's another example here um, where Jenny kind of started to felt trapped. I think I kind of spoke about this already, you know, feeling behind her peers. She kind of didn't have a lot of uh, monetary material support and or family support. She basically had to work a lot. Um, she was unable to maintain a study due to the late nights she was working so much. Mm. So she feels trapped now, like it's a bit hard for her to go back and get the degree. Of course, you mean she would have to get up shifts, you know, it's very expensive living in Melbourne, all yeah. that kind of thing. So, you know, just kind of pointing out these two contrasting examples here to show how class background plays a real, um, I suppose, influence on this trajectory yeah. um, and the possibility of leaving. Yeah. Okay, so... Now we're going to move on and talk about some of the gender and sexuality stuff, yep. um, which Julia's going to talk about. Yeah, sure. Um, so we've already we've sort of introduced this already in that um, we've talked about the ways that class and gender are, I guess, uh, leveraged or mobilised in the production of affective labour. So um, Catherine kind of hits the nail on the head when she sort of says that her she knows that. Um, her employer has sort of overtly said that um, it's good that all the women who work at this place are attractive and that's that's a good thing. Um, it's, it was something she was sort of aware of before, but to have it sort of stated um, overtly, yeah. she found uh, she found problematic <coughs> and confronting, but of course she was already aware of that herself, had already noticed that. But um, yeah, so yeah, it was difficult for her to, it was kind of one of those paradoxes that she had to deal with in her own um, in her own life because she is sort of being positioned not by choice in this way because she doesn't mm. necessarily perform um, a, a super kind of feminine um, way where she's wanting to be recognised for her sexual attractiveness. That's yeah, not where she's getting right. her sort of um, she's not creating her subjectivity in that way. It's being created for her because of the gender relations and heterosexual um, matrix of desire, yeah. which I'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and but that is absolutely central to actually her performing her job, That's right. and not by choice. So these things that pre-exist you and that ex exist outside of you, but you're, you're still um, brought it, drawn into yeah. because yep. that's what your body symbolically represents yep. to other people. And these places aren't like coyote ugly, right? They're not like that. <laughs> movie. These are kind of they're kind of bars. They're they're, they're not kind of. They're lefty <laughs> bars, but it's it's a fact that this is kind of part of that well, anyway. They do say they do tables. No, the they tables do. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that that's it. That, I'm sorry, the Catherine's. Yeah, that, that's a different one, I think. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, like so. But these are pretty kind of you know you know there's there's paintings of old ships on the plate on the walls here. These are yeah. kind of you know hooters, right? It's it's yeah, actual. Yeah, yeah. So the but demand of those, it's that demand is still there, yeah. even in these places that are kind of you know again have safe space on the stickers More classy and classy places. Yeah. They're not you know, these yeah. brash, it's not brashly kind of using feminine sexuality or, or what that symbolises, but it is still using it That's nonetheless. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is um, an interesting um, tension for Catherine and others. Yeah. So she, yeah, talks about in, in this example and on the previous page as well about yeah. um, how they do communal shots together 
they um, and sometimes themselves get so caught up in the fun they're having with she's having with her co-workers that she forgets that yeah. she is actually performing yeah. so at other times she says yeah I know we're putting it on and we're playing up to the crowd giving a bit of entertainment to the crowd or whatever joking around grinding up on each other and dancing but then there are other times when we just forget about it so there is a pleasurable aspect of yeah. this that is important that doesn't have performance aspects of it it is just being caught up in it and, be, and yeah. you are being yourself sometimes but that being yourself is something that is valued and yep. has meaning outside of your own control and what you would like it to be Absolutely, always, yeah. which is something that we find so interesting in this study yep. in terms of gender. And again, they're, they're quite reflexive about this, you know, referring back to the reflexivity stuff in the course that I've been talking about, you know, and then, so they sometimes ironic, they, I find this really interesting, sometimes they ironically do it, mm. which again is, is it ironically doing it when you kind of expected to do it, but they're doing it you know, and then their friends, they're kind of joking about it, but it's an expectation. And then other times they're caught up in the vibe and doing it. And then kind of probably yeah, sometimes yeah, halfway through thinking, oh, this is what we're doing, right? Yeah, so like again, this speaks to the subjectivity. Herself. Yeah, it catches yeah. herself, I think, is a really good way of doing it. So here the kind of um, the, the gender and sexuality part is part of this expectation of performance in this workplace, yeah. even in places that aren't kind of selling themselves, I suppose, or positioning themselves or designing their spaces for that. Yeah, and that tells us a lot, as um, feminist researchers tells us a lot about what it is to be a young woman or what these gender, um, what the gender relations are at the moment. So mm. even even in places where it's not being overtly mobilised, this is still this is still the norm. This is just yep. kind of what's expected and what is, you know, yep. um, even in more progressive places. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Which is really fascinating. And again, in more progressive places too, like so, I think I might have said earlier on in the course when we were talking about the Sex Pistols, right? Where punk is meant to be this space for these kind of people doing po political resistance. Well, in space, even in progressive you know, spaces like this, not everyone there will be progressive, right? Mm. People have come to, into these spaces for all different reasons. So mm. again, what we're going to get to talking about now, I suppose, is some of the management mm. of how, you know, those clashes when, you know, sometimes the social homology and social distancing starts to happen mm. all at once. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> we've talked about how sort of sexuality and, and gender, and we're mainly talking about heterose heterosexuality as the sort of underpinning power relationships going on with these gender relations but um, as a side note we'll say that doesn't at all mean that all the people in our study were heterosexual yeah. the actual sexualities or the uh, what people in the study Identify were in, identifying was much more fluid and broad but they yep. was but they were being brought into the heterosexual power matrix because it was the thing that existed in that space that they were playing yep. into encoded um, you know not not by their own choosing so yep. Um, I want to make that distinction. So, um, and I guess I'll, I'll mainly just sort of skip down to this point, the last one about the work of femininity and the heterosexual matrix of desire. So, this kind of, I guess, power relation governed the space in that um, it was the thing that made it, made them even have the jobs in the first place because management want, them, want there to be um, attractive women working there. That's the thing that governs them, knowing that the right thing to do is to um, have fun with each other, be pretty playful, don't be shy about you know, touching each other and, and creating that kind of um, fun, vivacious, pleasurable kind of young... Bubbly is a word bubbly. they use all the time, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, you can you probably get a picture in your head when you're saying this. You know, smiley and happy and just... Um, this is a lot of the stuff that Hostchild talks about too with air hostesses. Yeah. Um, <coughs> but in this space, harassment and the and sort of really um, behaviour that borders on even sexual assault occurs in these spaces quite often, and it is sort of they say that this yes this happens at work, but the threat of this is also normalised just in their everyday lives. Yeah, I, I would say actually so, it happens more than quite often. I'd say, again, in the Borgesian terms that I've been talking about, it's doxic. It is completely mm. normal and expected yeah. to the point where sometimes when we're asked questions, the response were just kind of rolling out their eyes at us as if to say, of course, this yeah. is what happens. Yeah, exactly. So um, this is the sort of undercurrent that's always there and it's interesting that it, it, 
was something that they, even though it was normalised, it was still something that many of the participants really were highly critical of and were really um, yep. strident in calling that kind of stuff out as well. Yep. Um, but it's this is it, yeah. So it's an important thing to talk about as underpinning this work, particularly in bringing to the fore all, all the paradoxes and complexities of what's going on here. So it's possible to enjoy performing femininity and um, be brought into that um, sexualized kind of environment. It's possible to enjoy that, but but that's not to say that it doesn't also have problems at the same time. Like yep. it's, it's really never one thing or the other. Yep. It's all of these things happening. And in terms of that effect, in terms of that vibe, the female respondents in particular all had their own kind of sense when the line was crossed from that kind of yep. fun conviviality through to kind of, you know, creepy harassment. Yeah, exactly. And the reason we're talking about this is because this, the all of this stuff, managing, negotiating all of this stuff is work. This is labour. It's labour, yeah. This is labour that is expected, that is unavoidable. Yeah. They're just they're called upon to do this labour by virtue of them being young women. Yeah, and it's not part of the jobs description or the contract. It's no. just all unsaid part of the yeah. doxy conditions of the work. And specific to them to their gender because of not because of them being essentially women and that would happen any time anywhere. This is this speaks to the current gender relations and the the current threat of sexual and physical violence that currently d it still does very much affect the lives of, of young women yep. particularly so that's that's where we're coming from with this so um, yeah so at the same time as you know creating buzz doing communal shots um, performing this vivacious femininity um, they are also continually monitoring this sexually charged environment to, for problems, for people mm. who they will be like, okay, this person is going to trans transgress this line. There's some yep. thing that's going to cross the line that's about to happen, and um, so they're always doing this additional layer of work. Yep, and labour. In throughout all the interviews we did, there was a very <laughs> common language about this. There was a, and it was about crossing the line, and the term they used all the time about particular men that was going to be like this. They could, they would develop a sense. Of when someone was going to be a problem was yeah. what they had the way they would uh, configure yeah. it a problem now whether that meant uh, they were going to be verbally abusive or you know handsy or beyond that or whether they were going to be violent or sometimes mm. even they thought they were going to be stealing stuff all the all the participants particularly the more experienced ones had developed what they called a vibe or don't say, a sense of being yeah. able to kind of tell even sometimes they would say without being talking to someone they could get a sense of of this just by their appearance or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we sort of skipped ahead to this crossing the line and risk side. Now I'll, I'll go back to the others in a second. But yeah, that's um, these examples we think are really, it's really important to acknowledge that this is what we're talking about and some of the, and to, uh, yeah, pay attention to the detail they're giving us and to what they're experiencing because a lot of the time this kind of work and these experiences aren't visible. They're, because they're so normalised, people don't actually yep. talk about them. They yep. might You might talk about it if you're... Um, Karen at work, your other um, female staff members might know about it, but it's not kind of common knowledge. So yeah. it, it's important to make this um, overt. I'm not going to read it out, but you should definitely read that whole quote yourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and it is, and, all, and a lot of the communication behind the bar too, when it's loud and noisy and stuff like that, it's like eye contact, um, it's kind of almost unsaid signalling, kind of you know nodding towards that guy. Yeah, Careful, yeah. like he's the one that's the current dickhead that we have to be concerned about yeah yeah now should I go back to the previous sure. slides yeah. yeah um yeah so at that same time we're up to yeah we're up to here um yeah reading the crowd so yeah, yeah you're reading the crowd for many things the you're reading the crowd to make sure that um people are having enough fun and do you need to you know, give special attention to someone when they come up mm. because you've been noticing standing in line, they're looking a bit pissed off. Do you need to kind of give a bit more, give them a bit more of your feminine luminosity yeah. to try to encourage them back into the vibe? Um, and Karen also talks about lulling people into a sense of comfort. So that's very deliberate work that's being done to, um, yeah, to yeah. work on their own um, mood, yeah. really. And again, in that quote there, like... Um, Make them f feeling like they're, when they walk out, feel like there's someone you know well and someone that's comfortable in your, your home. home. So yeah. again here, they're referring to a workplace as a kind of 
you know, home. This is again blurring those lines that we've been talking about throughout. Yeah, definitely. <coughs> so um, we're saying all this is significant because this is um, they're not just reflecting um, gender norms and just and just kind of reproducing them in this um, passive way. Femininity is then, I guess, always in process of being produced and reproduced through all of these in interactions this context, in yep. this context, and our, you know, in all of our aspects of our yep. lives, you know. Um, so it's done in lots of different ways, overtly, and you're always having to respond to things that the structures that exist before you. Same with class, same with ethnicity, yep. race, yep. all of these things. Um, and yeah, this example is about how difficult it is to. Um, tread that line where you are expected to, but you know you're um, being expected to perform a particular kind of femininity but that because of that heterosexual matrix of desire means that the threat is of um, it crossing over it can be very difficult to navigate and of course actually it's impossible for you to navigate that. Yeah. It, it depends on the person who is interacting with you and whether they're going to cross the line regardless yeah. of your behaviour actually. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, feeling like Karen's still feeling like she needs to manage that, um, and you know, we can see some some of the queer stuff happening in here too, where she's saying it's not just um, men hitting on me, it's women yeah. as well. Um, but she says she can also get misread because um, she's aware of the fact she makes a lot of eye contact, and some people take that further than she is. Yeah. So she's being read in ways that she yeah. is not having control over, and that's that's part of um, part of the really important stuff we're talking about here, yep. I think. Um, yep. And there is obviously this, when Karen says the next quote, I was just feeling very bar worky that night when she made out with someone behind the bar. Bar work has this, um, I guess, uh, implied sexuality to it. People are there to hook up. It's to a sexually people. charged atmosphere. It's yeah. a sexually charged yep. atmosphere and they are implicitly part of that and it's difficult to navigate sometimes. Sometimes it's mm. enjoyable. Um, sometimes it crosses over to not being enjoyable at all and to actually be quite scary sometimes. Yeah. Yep. All of these things at once. Yeah. And um, again, I think this, the kind of uh, earlier on in the course, I was talking about how the, um, there needs to be increasing work in youth studies to kind of blur the youth transitions, youth cultures. Um, and this kind of, you know, sexual nature of, you know, going out, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll stuff, there's a real rite of passage thing that's kind of been largely left out of the youth transitions literature. Mm. And I only really talked about in nighttime economy stuff and some youth culture, but it's obviously a place where young people, you know, learn about who they are and what they want to be and all that kind of thing as well. So, again, that rite of passage literature I think is interesting to think about, you know, what goes on in these spaces in terms of, mm. you know, learning about this kind of stuff and your own identity and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've already talked about um, this line and crossing the line. Yeah. So the, I think I think the interesting here to think that Karen talks about is it this one that where there's kind of she talks about both um, it might be, it might, be the next. might be the next one where there's like a, a line between being able to manage this stuff at the at the job where it's a particular space but also the way that just being a young woman means you have to face this kind of yeah. harassment and ogling or whatever in day to day life and there's a kind of the, the different respondents have different ways of dealing with this where some kind of felt comfortable res, you know responding and dealing with that everywhere because they felt particularly yeah. able to do it. Others felt they were they could, you know, engage with that kind of harassment more aggressively at work, but then in their day-to-day -day lives they kind of they felt a little bit more kind yeah. of scared of and fearful and wouldn't kind of get in a confrontation. So again here these kind of levels of sexual harassment and that kind of stuff, yeah. um, contextual um, and managed in very different ways by the, by the people involved in the research. Yeah. So this one here, you know, like a good example where the guy comes in, talks to the boss about the weather, and then as soon as he leaves the room, starts being really creepy with her. Yeah. It becomes, you know, what what is she meant to do? She's it's late afternoon. They're in there by themselves. How do you manage this? Yeah. Well, essentially, you kind of brush him, and then you kind of tell management, and then he comes in again, does it again. Luckily, in this instance, management supports them. Yeah. Her but do not have to serve him anymore. But 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 you know, but notice doesn't kick him out. Yeah, yeah. At other venues, they would kick him out. At other venues, they would say, wake up yourself, just get on with it, that's part of your job. So the, yeah. the different bars themselves and the different kind of management and things they have were all very um, influential on the, I suppose, possibility of mm. individuals dealing with this kind of stuff in the way that they felt satisfied and safe. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Inst um, yeah, instinct for creeps. So again, yeah. I was talking about this kind of 
stuff earlier on. You know, she gets told that she's just decoration, um, and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. We've already spoken a little bit about <coughs> how the, this instinct, having this instinct, they sort of talk about as being. Uh, yeah, as sociologists, we're always interested when people talk about things as just being natural in the way they are, yeah. and and mapping what that actually tells us about the broader social context that's going on. So just having this instinct for it to be able to to de detect creeps and also knowing that you're the one who has to detect them. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That says that tells us a lot about the heterosexual <coughs> that's right. matrix of desire really and what that how that is embodied in everyday life by young women. Yeah. Yeah. And so we've spoke a little bit about this harassment and risk instinct. What, what an interesting finding here um, is I think um, and it, it, it's relatively common this, but like it was the first time we'd heard it actually spoken about out in the open, mm. is the way that um, often women were sent to deal with the problems or the violent guy or the, or the, you know, the general dickhead mm. because it was deemed that they were, the, the male would be less likely to be violent towards the female staff. Yeah. Yeah, we've been... Uh, yeah, this is something we've been speaking about a lot as that it came up through the data and because it's something that I find as a feminist as a, as a woman to be honest really problematic because often women are being called upon to kick out the same people who have maybe been trying to grope them or yeah. have been um, saying really um, sort of aggressively sexual things to them so I see this as being highly problematic but also it, this is just I guess speaks to the complexity and paradoxes of current gender relations where yeah. Um, what's going on here is that gender relations and the norm of, you know, the unspoken or sometimes overtly spoken thing that you don't hit women in public anyway, yep. that is being leveraged in this example yep. to, so this is being something where men are then having to confront being thrown out by a woman, what are you going to do? Yeah. They, they are assuming that the male no matter how aggressive he's been is not going to transgress that line yeah because he so he has so many people watching him so um gender ma like masculine gender norms are being brought into this as well not only yeah. feminine ones of passivity which is the gender obviously part of the gender norm there but yeah i think that's really it's really fascinating well and the masculine interactions in that i find interesting as well yeah. right it's like there seems there's an assumption, and it's probably a very real assumption. I can picture it happening now. Is that if you send the mail bar worker over to get rid of the male problem, a couple of things can happen. Firstly, it could get ugly, and there could be like you know hegemonic masculinity. Okay, oh, let's have who's a fight. Bigger, yeah, who's the more? Secondly, the another thing that's likely to happen is I'll just laugh about it. Yeah, and go and come, on, mate. come on, mate. She's, yeah, she doesn't yeah. have a sense of humour, does yeah. she? Yeah, right, and I'll just bro out. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, yeah. So exactly. again. It seems to be that that's the thing that's been happening in these spaces, and this has developed as a way of actually getting something to happen mm. better. Well, not better. Better is the wrong word. Like you know, actually deal with the pragmatic of the problem to get yeah. rid of the problem. But you know, it then brings up all these other quite obvious you know gender ethics that are that yeah. are problematic. And then, and again, I would also say you know, the idea that a man won't hit a girl is true until it actually happens, right? Of course, and it does <laughs> happen in public as yeah, well. It's just that. Yeah. It's yeah, a norm is being mobilised in yeah. this, and yeah. that's not to say it's going to go how it's planned. That's right. And the other thing, um, yeah, so there's lots of really interesting things happening here. I think what Tim says about um, a girl having legitimacy to call out this behaviour because yeah. the guy can't bro out on her and say, "Oh, come on, I was just having a joke." Or if he does, then as other participants say, he'll get a no straight back, like, "No, yeah. this isn't funny. That wasn't not serious. This yeah. does matter. You're out." Yeah. Um, but also the, the thing also that I think we need to be careful about is that this isn't something that that um, management can expect to occur. This shouldn't be an expectation. This has to be something, yeah. if we're going to sort of go with it, that needs to be um, decided upon by the people, yeah. by the woman who's being asked to do yeah. it. If you're being required to do this because you're a woman, that's a whole other realm of mm. labour that um, is has all kinds of problematic yep. implications that put you literally in harm's way. <laughs> yeah, that's right, they do. And, and so, um, and again, this speaks a little bit to the, um, I suppose, personality of the specific bars. They, they're quite yeah. small. They do have security, but not a lot sometimes. Mm. So in some ways, you hear you have these kind of young, untrained bar staff expected to do some of the security work when there's no security there that night. Yeah, um, often, would be like, oh, what? Yep, often, <laughs> often they have 
somewhat problematic relations between the bar staff and the security or, you know, and that kind of stuff. So there's all other things going on there. Um, and so this seems to be the um, using sexuality itself as a business strategy to kind of do some of the, the security work, which, as Julia said, can't really um, become policy, that's for sure. No, I think yeah. it's, it's certainly, it's, it's highly problematic and, yeah, it needs to be thought through instead of just, yeah, to, yeah taken yeah. up. Um, but I guess it just shows the complexity of all the things we're dealing with. It's maybe the best example of how um, yeah. how complex all of these things are. And yeah. Yeah. Need yeah. to really pull out the the dynamics yeah. of them. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So we've gone through some data um, again reasonably quickly. I hope you can take the time to kind of read the the essay. The, sorry, the lecture slides and the, quotes. Uh, and the quotes in particular because I think they're you know really interesting. So just to, to sum up what we're uh, what we're talking about, I suppose one of the things that I've I find really useful with this research is that again, as we've said, the young people are kind of positioned to do this kind of job, these jobs with training wheels. Apparently, you know that anyone could do, you know, just pour a beer or you know just pack shelves or whatever these jobs are. But I, I think what this research shows that, you know, what young people get paid for in here doesn't really cover the actual jobs that they're doing. They're doing all this kind of you know, management stuff and vibe stuff and all that kind of stuff. But from a more broader analysis perspective in terms of youth studies and the, the um, I suppose, the importance of the very concept of youth to capitalism is that their very presence, young people's very presence, symbolically, representationally, all that kind of stuff, um, is a very important in these spaces for them to work, for them to be the spaces that the owners want them to be. Mm. So... Um, you know, you could do this kind of research at any kind of bar, really, like in pubs. It's all kind of happening. It'll be different kind of taste cultures, different time of class, different gender relations and all that kind of thing. But the young people working there will be there for particular, these I think, is effective immaterial labour that doesn't really get spoken about, um, but that yeah. is profoundly important to the success of these nighttime economies yeah. and the way that value is increasingly extracting mm. um, out of, you know, our very subjectivities rather than just our kind of discrete skills yeah and that they're not skills that you um leave at work and go home and then you know you don't leave at the door yeah that's right yeah 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 that's right yeah so um yeah so overall you know we want to kind of bring i suppose attention this research is trying to bring attention to the very laboring practices of young people that shows that you know um they're very important to the economy um i would argue that you know, there's a lot of skill going on in these places that's kind of unheralded. Um, um, and from a sociological perspective, they can draw out, you know, really interesting gender, sexuality, class relations. They can kind of, I think, what we're finding here is <coughs> illustrations of kind of broader general social relations. And mm -hmm. it's a kind of way for us to kind of draw those out and to understand them and, and yep. maybe to do something about them. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yep. Okay, um, I'll leave it there. Thanks.